So in this lecture, we're going to look at Fubini's theorem, which has different varieties, different versions of the statement. For Fubini's theorem, we're going to imagine that we have a continuous function over a rectangle. So for example, here we have a function over this rectangle a through b cross c through d to r. So this is the graph of a nice scalar valued function of two variables over a rectangle. Now when we integrate this function over this rectangular domain, what we hope to compute is this solid block of volume enclosed between the graph of the function and the rectangle. Here I'm graphing my function as if it were positive, so everything we're looking at is positive volume, but of course if my function dipped below the xy plane, we would have some negative volume. Now what is the definition of Riemann integration? What process do we do when we compute a Riemann integral? Well, what we do is we partition the domain. So we chop along both the x-axis and the y-axis to subdivide this rectangular domain into subrectangles. Then we say that the volume enclosed between the graph of this function and the xy plane can be estimated by adding up the volumes of a bunch of prisms. So the volumes we use to estimate the true volume under the graph of this function is formed by a prism. So we pick some height and we multiply it by the area of the base or the volume of the base. And that gives us the volume of this prism. We add all these up so they would look like columns and it estimates the true volume under the graph of this function. Now this is hard to do in practice, right? Students, when you teach calculus, they usually don't like doing Riemann sums, whether it's one-dimensional integration or two-dimensional integration. So we teach them shortcuts. And what happens in a multivariable calculus setting is that the shortcut we teach usually replaces for students the definition of, say, the double integral. So this is the definition of Riemann integration for a function of two variables. You partition both the x-coordinates and the y-coordinates, and your Riemann sum would be a double sum. In practice, when we actually compute a double integral by hand, what we usually do is Fubini's theorem. I haven't stated Fubini's theorem yet, but let me give the visual picture of what Fubini's theorem allows us to do. Now imagine, instead of partitioning my rectangular domain with respect to x and y, as we are told to do with Riemann integration, I only chop, say, perpendicular to the x-axis. So I chop up my x-coordinate, but I don't chop up my y-coordinate. Then what we're doing is taking basically a loaf of bread and slicing into it. What Fubini's theorem suggests we should do is estimate the volume enclosed between the graph of our function and the domain, not by adding up a bunch of prisms, like in the previous picture, but by adding up volumes which look like the volumes of, say, bread slices. So if I could compute the volume of this slice, it's not a prism, it's like a slice, and add up all of the slices, that would also be a way to estimate the volume under the graph of this function. Okay, so let's see what happens if we take this approach. Now it's easiest for me to draw the slice if I do the very first one, but of course we want to imagine that we're looking at say the ith slice. Then the width of the slice, like the, the width of the crust of the bread, we could think of as delta xi. So that's like a little change in the x-axis. So then this bread volume could be viewed as a prism traveling this way. It's not the same type of prism as in Riemann integration. Instead, I'm gonna multiply the thickness of the bread times the area of this face. It's like where I spread the butter. I can't talk about this without talking about bread and butter. Okay, so the volume of this bread slice is going to be approximately the area of the face times the thickness of the bread. The thickness of the bread is delta xi, so what is the area of the face? Well, that's what I'm trying to graph over here on the right. So in this picture, you want to imagine that the positive x-axis is pointing straight at your eye so that you're only looking down at the yz plane. Our y-coordinates go from c all the way to d because we didn't slice in a direction perpendicular to the y-axis. 
And then the value of this function from y equals c to y equals d is given by this curve here. So if I'm picking, I don't know, the left side of the bread or the right side of the bread or some special point, I don't want to be too specific here. Let me just say I've picked some xi star value. This curve we have here is exactly what you would get if you fixed the x-coordinate for some representative point associated to the ith slice. You fix the x-coordinate and then you let y go from c to d. So viewed like this, what we're looking at is just a function of one variable. And our slice area is now just area under the graph of that curve. So it's going to be the integral, just one dimensional integral from C to D of F of X I star, that's a fixed number, comma Y dy. So this is just a one dimensional area. Okay, and then the volume of a slice of bread, not the entire loaf, but just a slice, is equal to the area of the face. So that's what we just wrote down as the integral from C to D of F of X I star comma Y DY. So that times Delta X I. So that's area of the face times thickness of the bread. And then let's call that first quantity, the area of the face, let's call that G of X I star. Notice after you've done this definite integral with respect to y, you won't see y anymore. You'll still see x i star. It'll be some formula with respect to x i star. So that's going to be our function g of x i star times delta x i. So now the volume of the entire loaf is going to be the sum over all the slices we made. So I'll just say i equals 1 through n. So suppose that we've subdivided the x axis into n subintervals with our slicing g of x i star times delta x i. Now this isn't the type of integration that we've done, but this is exactly the type of calc one Riemann sum that you do when you first define integration. So this is like a Riemann sum for the function g of x from x equals a to x equals b. So this is like integrate from a to b g of x dx. But what is g of x? Well, now this is like integrate from a to b. Let me take g of x and replace it with how we defined g. Integrate from c to d f of x, y, dy, dx. Let me make a couple of remarks. This isn't a proof. This is just an illustration. The second remark is you might look at this and think, yeah, that's a double integral. I know that. But this is not really a double integral. This is how we usually compute double integrals in multivariable calculus. First, integrate the inside one with respect to y, say, and then integrate the outside one with respect to x. But that is not the same as doing the actual Riemann integration over this domain. This is what we call iterated integration. So this is a single dimensional integral and then a single dimensional integral. It is not actually the same thing as the double integral of f over this domain, not conceptually. Now what Vibini's theorem tells us though is that in a lot of cases it's a perfectly good way to compute the Riemann integral of f over this domain. So again this is a very friendly statement for Fubini's theorem. There are ways to generalize it to functions which aren't perfectly continuous, etc. But for our purposes let's just let r be a rectangle in r2, just like the one we've sketched, and let f be continuous on r. Sorry that a should be r. Then Fubini's theorem tells us that the double integral of f over this domain, so here this means the double integral. This is not integrate an integral. It's a single calculation, really. It's just a two-dimensional integral. Can be computed with slicing. So here this is integrate with respect to y first, then with respect to x. That's like the picture we just looked at. Or you could have sliced the other direction integrate first with respect to x, then with respect to y. So this symbol here is the double integral. But with slicing, what we're really doing is iterated integrals. One remark I'll make here is this dA really means the base is an area. 
So I could have written dx dy or dy dx, but what I really mean is, is this integral represents taking a function height and multiplying it by an area base to get a prism and then add up all those prisms. So this differential here is trying to indicate to you that when we're doing this double integral, we have a base which is a two-dimensional area because we're integrating over a region in R2. Versus dy means integrate first with respect to y for y values and then with respect to x along the one-dimensional x-axis. Now let's do some examples. So just to remind ourselves, Fubini's theorem says that for a continuous function on the rectangle AB cross CD, which means that A is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to B, and C is less than or equal to Y is less than or equal to D, that's what that notation means. The double integral of F over that rectangle can be more practically calculated as two iterated integrals. Either first take F and integrate it with respect to y from c to d, and then with respect to x from a to b, or the reverse. Take f and integrate it with respect to x from a to b, and then with respect to y from c to d. So let's do this double integral. Our integrand is 3x squared plus cosine pi y. We're going to do this inside integral first. So we're going to take our integrand and integrate it with respect to x, which means we treat y like a constant. Then when we're done with that process, we'll integrate what's left with respect to y from zero to one. If I anti-differentiate the integrand with respect to x, the antiderivative of three x squared with respect to x is x cubed. And then cosine pi y with respect to x is like a constant. So the antiderivative of that will be x times cosine pi y. This is a definite integral, so we're not going to pick up a constant of integration. So after evaluating the inside integral, we still have the outside integral, so I'm still enclosing this inside of the integration from 0 to 1 of something with respect to y. But now we can evaluate that inside integral from x equals 0 to x equals 2. I often label my bounds of integration here just so I remember what variable I'm working with. So this inside integral was integrating with respect to x. We use the fundamental theorem of calculus, plug in the top bound, subtract off plugging in the bottom bound. So we get 2 cubed plus 2 times cosine pi y minus the quantity 0 cubed plus 0 cosine pi y. So overall, we now have a single integral, the integral from 0 to 1, of the quantity 8 plus 2 cosine pi y with respect to y. This is just calc 1 integration, so we take the antiderivative. With respect to y, that's 8y plus 2 over pi sine pi y. Here, of course, y is going from 0 to 1. Plug in the top bound, subtract off plugging in the lower bound, and we're left with 8. So that's what it means to do iterated integration. Start inside, integrate with respect to one variable, work your way outside. Let's take a look at the next two examples. This first example is really written more as a double Riemann integral. So we would like to compute f of x and y equals x plus y as a double integral over the rectangle x is between 0 and 1, and y is between 1 and 3. I'm going to write this now as an iterated integral with Fubini's theorem. So I've chosen to order this as a dy dx integral, meaning that my outside bounds are for x. So on the outside integral, we're going to integrate from 0 to 1 with respect to x, and then the inside integral is integrating from 1 to 3 x plus y with respect to y. Now we go through this integrand and anti-differentiate with respect to y, treating x like a constant. So the antiderivative of x with respect to y would be x times y, plus the antiderivative of y with respect to y would be 1 half y squared, and then this is a definite integral, so we use the fundamental theorem of calculus and evaluate this at the top bound minus evaluating it at the bottom bound. 
After plugging in those bounds, that leaves us with 3x plus 9 halves minus x minus 1 half. This is now the integrand for a single dimensional integral integrating from 0 to 1 with respect to x. See, if I simplify a little bit, that's going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of 2x plus 4. Anti-differentiate with respect to x, and we get x squared plus 4x from 0 to 1. We evaluate that and we get 5. The second example on this slide is already written with iterated integrals. So first we're going to anti-differentiate with respect to x, evaluating this integral from 1 to 2. That's our inside integral. The point of this example is really just to mention that when you're doing a single dimensional integral, so if we're doing iterated integrals, each one is a single dimensional integral one at a time, we can employ techniques from single variable calculus. So if you look at this first expression here, x e to the 2x, that looks like a u substitution. So in particular, for that first term, let's have u equal x squared so that du is 2x dx. This is a definite integral, so I'm going to change my bounds. The bounds of 1 and 2 were for x. What are they for u? Well, when x equals 1, u is 1 squared, so u is also 1. But when x equals 2, u is 2 squared, so u would be 4. So the bounds of that integral with respect to u are going to go from 1 to 4. That means that this inside integral, the integral from 1 to 2 of x e to the x squared plus y with respect to x, can be broken into two integrals, the integral from 1 to 2 of x e to the x squared dx, plus the integral from 1 to 2 of y dx. That's another technique that I'm using here from single variable calculus. The integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. I'm not ready to evaluate the first integral yet because I, I need to switch over now with the u substitution. So what was x will be 1 half du and then e to the u. And my bounds are going to go from 1 to 4. We're integrating that now with respect to u. The second integral is straightforward. So let's go ahead and anti-differentiate y with respect to x. That's just x times y because we treat y like a constant. And then our bounds are from x equals 1 to x equals 2. Okay, so that first integral now is simple. With respect to u, that's going to be 1 half e to the u evaluated at 4 minus evaluated at 1. So when I do that, I get half e to the 4th minus half e plus 2y minus y from the second integral. All of that was for the inside integral. Now we move to the outside integral. To finish this problem, we need to integrate from 1 to 3 the quantity above. So 1 half e to the 4th minus half times e plus y dy. This is simple. I'm not going to have room to finish it on this slide, but that's OK. Here we're just going to anti-differentiate with respect to y and then plug in the top and bottom bounds. So then the antiderivative of this with respect to y is 1 half e to the 4th y minus e over 2 times y plus y squared over 2. I'll let you finish that one. It's just a question of plugging in y equals 3 and then subtracting off plugging in y equals 1. Let's look at the last pair of examples. I would like to integrate x cubed e to the y squared plus sine y sine x plus x times the square root of tangent of y squared with respect to y from negative pi over 3 to pi over 4, and then with respect to x from negative 1 to 1. So this is a pair of iterated integrals. Now you can spend a while trying to anti-differentiate this with respect to y, but I don't think you're going to be able to. The nice thing about Fubini's theorem is if we have a continuous function over a rectangle, here our rectangle is negative 1 to 1 for x, negative pi over 3 to pi over 4 for y, Fubini's theorem allows us to slice in both directions. So we don't have to stick with dy dx. We can actually reverse the order of integration here. So I'm duplicating my integrand, but now I'm first going to integrate with respect to x. 
which means my innermost bounds need to go from negative one to one. Then we'll integrate with respect to y from negative pi over three to pi over four. So instead of slicing in one direction, we're gonna slice in the other direction. Now integration is hard. It's quite possible that this would also not be integrable, but it is. So I wrote this problem just to hammer this point home that sometimes with Fubini's theorem, you might not like the order of integration that you start with your first attempt. It's okay to, to try it the other way. What happens with this particular integrand is that the first expression is odd in x and we're integrating from negative one to one. So that first expression will be zero. Sine of x is also an odd function as is x. So all three of these expressions in the integrand are odd functions of x. So the entire integrand is odd with respect to x, which means that when we integrate from negative one to one, we're gonna get zero by odd symmetry. So overall, this integral is zero. So that's good news. For this last one, go ahead and attempt this on your own, pause the video, and then I'll work through it. Here, you can try this the order you're given. You can switch the order if you want, it's up to you. Okay, this integrand, unlike the example above, can be computed by hand with respect to x uh, just fine. So that first expression is gonna be 1 half x squared y. Then the second expression is x e to the y. So that's the antiderivative of the integrand that we started with with respect to x. Then we plug in our top and bottom bounds. We're left with the integral from negative one to two of nine halves y plus three e to the y minus zero dy. Anti-differentiate that with respect to y, you get 9 fourths y squared plus 3e e to the y, evaluated from negative 1 to 2. And overall, that's 9 plus 3e e squared minus 9 over 4 minus 3 over e. I hope you enjoyed this look at Fubini's theorem. It's really a helpful theorem. It means that we're going to be able to integrate a lot of double integrals and later triple integrals by hand without setting up Riemann sums because we're able to take those integrals and reinterpret them as iterated single dimensional integrals and then we can integrate them in the usual way that we learned in single variable calculus. Thank you for your attention.